story. Yeah, it looks like. Okay, um, folks, we're going to get started here. Um, the light is on, so that means to go. And welcome everyone this evening um, to our Albany City Council meeting. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Would you like to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Allison, could we get a roll call, please? Olson? Here. Sykes? Yo. Johnson? Here. Kellum? Here. Kopsinski? Here. Coburn? Here. Canopa? Here. Okay. And we do have one um, change here on tonight's agenda, and that is item number four, which is special presentation. It's going to be taken up at our next um, council meeting next month for the Life Saving Awards. So with that, we have scheduled business. And first council, as you have on page three, this would be accepting Mike Newman's resignation from the Airport Advisory Commission. Move to accept. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. And next is on page I assume four. we'll send him a note thanking him for his yes. service on that committee. Yep, we will. Thank you, Dick. Um, next is accepting Bobby Schuler's resignation from the Planning Commission since he um, moved from <laughs> Ward 3 to Ward 1. Move to accept. Second. Okay. <clears throat> Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Same code, so I present. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Next, this is on page five and six, and this is actually on the um, um, appealing of the zone ma zoning map amendment. And council, you did have already a motion that was um, on the table last time, and this was a motion to deny, but we were missing Councillor Sykes, so we did not have enough um, to be able to take action at that meeting. So, yeah. May I request that the motion to deny, to deny be deemed a motion for a tentative denial with direction to staff to bring back findings and conclusions at the next meeting? What happens yeah. is you don't have in your packet denial findings. The law requires you to have findings and conclusions of law for any quasi-judicial <coughs> land use decision. And so what you do is you make a two-step decision. You make a tentative decision tonight to deny, to approve, to uh, approve with conditions, and then staff will bring you back at the next meeting uh, findings and conclusions to support that decision. Mm -hmm. well, I have no problem yeah. with that, except do, does everybody remember who the, who the motioner and the seconder was. Well, I moved. Um, then I must have been the second. I, I think, think so. I wrote then down for the... It's fine with me. Okay. It's fine with you. I wrote down it was a 3-2 and the two no's was Bessie and Ray on the motion. So, and we don't have minutes to it, but I don't... We have notes. And I would so yeah. move for denial as recommended by the city attorney. Second. And his conditions and so forth. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, a couple comments and then a, <laughs> and then a question. Uh, I do understand that staff uh, has the ability and is required to come back with findings uh, to approve or deny one way or the other, uh, which has always given me a mental conundrum on how one can be right one way and be right the other way also. Be that as it may, that's, that's the way it is. But I do have a question. Uh, seeing what's happened over in uh, Corvallis over the last couple of years on their land use appeals, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and the potential that the developer could arbitrarily say, uh, I'm not going to bother with this anymore. I'm just simply going to build apartments as outlined by uh, the existing code with absolutely no input or uh, opportunity to uh, stop that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's one of those, be very, very careful what you wish for, because you could have these 300-room uh, apartment uh, complex set up there with absolutely no uh, private development type thing, and that just, I think that result scares me more than what he's trying to do. Having said that, uh, a question for the city attorney is, 
based on the criteria that we were all given, ostensibly we're all trying to follow uh, along here, the only mention that came up that ostensibly uh, the city attorney, Sean, uh, thought was a plausible reason for denial was the uh, number five uh, transportation pattern. Uh, I guess I'm wondering from the city attorney's standpoint uh, whether or not that would be enough of a single item of a defense uh, if it was brought to Luba uh, or would they have us come back and go through the process of paralysis getting hammered with year after year after year? Well, it's difficult to forecast the future. It's difficult to know if there would be an appeal and then you asked me how it would come out. <clears throat> Let me say that you have a professional staff that reviews the code and they make a recommendation to you based on their analysis of how a particular application lines up with the code. <clears throat> and so I would say that the, the weight to some degree rests with your staff. They make good judgments and they make good recommendations. Having said that, however, it's the job of your staff and your attorney to defend your decisions. And uh, I believe uh, a denial is defensible. It's not a slam dunk, but I believe it is that staff can write findings and conclusions that would be sustained by the Land Use Board of Appeals in likelihood. Again, I cannot give you any guarantees. I think you are always safer when you follow staff recommendations, but you don't need to. You're the ones who are elected to make the decisions, and our job is simply to tell you what we think and then our job is to defend whatever you choose to do, and that's what we'll do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Call the question. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. Could we get a roll call? Olson. Aye. Yes. Aye. Sykes. Aye. Johnson. No. Kellum. Yes. Kopsinski? No. Coburn? Yes. Okay. So the motion um, passed, which was a motion for denial. Yes, and may I comment? Tentative. We will at the next meeting, Tentative. Yeah. we will be bringing you findings, and, well, probably not me, <laughs> staff will be bringing you <laughs> findings and conclusions. And it is important, it is imperative that the four votes who prevail tonight be at the next meeting to adopt those findings and conclusions because you are going to be running up against the 120 day time limit very soon. And so if for any reason of the four who voted made the majority decision, if you can't, if something comes up, call in so that we can connect you by telephone for the adoption of the findings and conclusions. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, with that, I need to um, be able to read this for the record then. So a legislative decision of the City Council may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals by filing a notice of intent to appeal not later than 21 days after the decision becomes final. Within five working days following adoption of an amendment or new land use regulation, the director shall forward to the Department of Land Conservation and Development a copy of the adopted text and findings and notify the department of any substantial changes which may have occurred in the proposal since any previous notification to the department. And then we will make sure we read this again after we do the final, um, from when we get adopt the findings too. Okay? With that, anything else on this fall that you needed? Okay, all right, okay. Thank you, folks. Okay, um, next is, um, this is gonna be a legislative public hearing. And with that, this is gonna be over our Central Albany Code Amendments. And I don't have a, um, so I do have that. Okay, on tonight's agenda is a legislative public hearing regarding text amendments to the Albany Development Code as described in planning file CP0317, DC0117, and ZC0217. The applicant is the City of Albany Community Development Department Planning Division. I call to order this legislative public hearing at 7.25 p.m. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table next to the city clerk and do any members wish to declare a conflict of interest? Do any members wish to abstain from participating in the proceedings? 
For those wishing to testify, please be aware that you must raise an issue with enough detail to afford the council and parties an opportunity to respond to the issue if you later want to raise that issue on appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals. Testimony and evidence must be directed towards approval standards staff will describe or other criteria in the Comprehensive Plan or Development Code which you believe to apply to the decision. If additional documents or evidence are provided by any party, the City Council may allow a continuance or leave the record open to allow the parties a reasonable opportunity to respond. At this time, I call for the staff report, so Planning Manager Bob Richardson. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor and City Council. Um, this, uh, Mayor Knope just said tonight um, this, this public hearing is, uh, is regarding a package of amendments to the Development Code the Albany Development Code, um, zoning mass, and comprehensive uh, plan. The, the overall purpose and intent of these amendments uh, is, to, um, is to promote and implement urban renewal goals for the Central Albany area. And uh, shown on the screen here is the subject area, which includes three zones, uh, the historic downtown zone, the central business zone, and then the waterfront zone. And um, we're also proposing to create a new zone called the downtown mixed use zone uh, that would be on the west side of the uh, of the historic downtown zone. And we'll get into to that in a, in a little bit. Um, what I wanted to do tonight, I guess I'll start by introducing uh, Becky Hewitt from Angela Planning Group. Um, she's been in front of the council before um, with this project, and she'll be leading uh, most of the presentation. But before I turn it over to her, um, I wanted to cover uh, two slides here. And the first is to kind of quickly go through the public outreach that we undertook regarding this project. And then, um, and then kind of walk through the, the six project objectives that have um, guided this effort uh, from the get-go. So in terms of, um, of public outreach, way, way back in the beginning, this is probably a year and a half ago now or, or so, um, we met with uh, stakeholders, um, uh, developers, the Chamber of Commerce, Albany Downtown Association, um, and, and asked them what issues they might see in terms of facilitating the kind of development that we want for Central Albany. We held a public open house. We created an online survey to collect uh, input from, um, from residents. We sent out a, um, a postcard to to all property owners and tenants within the subject area, as well as within 200 feet of that area. We really wanted to let people know that there was um, changes under consideration and to give them the opportunity to become more informed about those changes and participate in the process. Then uh, we held uh, multiple joint work sessions uh, with the City Council and the Planning Commission, and at least one of those, the Landmarks Advisory um, Commission, participated in. And a lot of you were there. And if you'll recall, during, during those uh, joint work sessions, the, the purpose was to develop and then refine code concepts. So we're trying to, um, to land collectively um, on on the big ideas for how we could amend the code to achieve um, what we wanted to. Um, and from those code concepts, those bigger ideas, we have been working over the, the last um, several months to create um, specific code language that would implement those ideas. And that's what's before you this evening, is, is that particular language for you to evaluate, give feedback, revise as you might see fit, and, and, um, and hopefully, um, except if it's, if it's a message to believe. We did send out, um, after the, the code concept, we sent out public notice and we held a public hearing with the Planning Commission. And as we'll talk about tonight, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the package of amendments. Um, but they did uh, direct staff to make, um, make some revisions, which we did. And there were others that, that uh, they didn't actually um, see what the revisions were, and we're going to be highlighting those for you this evening. But they, they, um, they requested that staff go back and consider a certain idea and incorporate that idea into this new uh, um, set of, of amendments that, you, that you'll be looking at. Um, so Becky will go through what those, what those revisions are and the refinements the Planning Commission identified. Um, 
So we'll get into that at kind of a high level uh, in just a few minutes. The project objectives um, that have been guiding this project, um, on the screen there's six of them. One is to remove obstacles to housing and other development in Central Albany. And the, the basic idea with that is, is if we can get people living downtown um, and investing downtown, that's just going to you know, kind of create that, that economic vitality that we're all looking for, get more people um, down, more people into the existing buildings, and, and, um, and keep those buildings alive for, for many years to come. We wanted to create um, development standards that would result in attractive development and a desirable building form. We wanted to align the uses to the goals for each zone. So as I mentioned, there are three zones, plus we're proposing a new one. And each of those zones has a, um, a purpose statement. It's already included in the, in the development code. And what we, we found was, um, and was brought to our attention, I should really say, from, from public and developers, was that um, sometimes uh, the purpose of the zone wasn't being implemented by the uses that were um, allowed. And so what we try to do was to say, uh, is to evaluate those, those land uses and make sure that for each zone, um, if there was a use that, that we wanted to promote, that we made it easy for that use to occur. And if there was a use that was less desirable to occur in that zone, we either said, uh, that's just not permitted, or we, we uh, moved it into um, a process where it could go in front of the Planning Commission for, for review to evaluate compatibility impacts so that we weren't um, putting or allowing some use to occur where, where, where it would have negative impacts. We wanted to create clear, objective, and easy to understand regulations. And as Becky will, will say um, later on in this presentation, that doesn't always mean fewer words. It means that we try to be clear and what we wanted the standard to be so that we could avoid um, ambiguity and uncertainty for a developer. So we had to write things out as clearly as possible. And sometimes you'll see that that looks like things got longer, but the hope is that it makes it um, clearer so that there's uh, more certainty for any developer who's coming to town. Um, we evaluated parking requirements and uh, are proposing to, um, to reduce parking requirements to make it easier for uh, redevelopment of small lots and infill development to occur in this area. And we wanted to match the development regulations to the context of the area. So we wanted to make sure that our development regulations were appropriate for this more urban uh, and more dense area um, instead of um, being something that might also be appropriate for our suburban area. So we tried to to reframe and rethink about what we were trying to accomplish in the central Albany area and how that might be different from development that would occur um, in other areas of town because the central Albany area in downtown is, is unique. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Becky. We'll, we'll switch seats here and um, she'll go through the rest of the presentation. We're gonna keep it at a, at a pretty high level and, um, and then let you direct uh, us and into the topics and issues that you want to explore in more detail. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Becky Hewitt with Angelo Planning Group. Um, many of you are familiar faces, so thank you for your participation throughout this process. And um, glad to be here tonight to present what the product is that's, that's come through this process. Um, Bob did a great job of kind of giving the overview. We are going to stay pretty high level because we want to be able to get into specifics only where your interests and questions are because otherwise we would be here all night. We know you have other things on the agenda. Um, so Bob mentioned um, kind of removing obstacles to housing is one of the key goals going into this project. So one of the um, proposed amendments um, Bob mentioned a new zone. It's a new downtown mixed use zone. It would apply in this area shown in red down here that is currently designated historic downtown, kind of on the southwest side of our area. Um, the areas that were shown in red, those were identified through this public process as being areas where it was appropriate to allow ground floor housing, um, but where the, the current code limits or prohibits it. So in that area, the proposed solution is this new zone, this downtown mixed use zone. In this other area that's zoned central business, 
um, in kind of the, the central part of our area. That, um, it, there, it's now a conditional use review to do ground floor townhomes or apartments, and the proposed amendments would make that permitted um, subject to site plan review only. <coughs> Um, other obstacles to development, and, and Bob touched on a couple of these as well. Um, reducing uncertainty, so an example of this is in the waterfront zone. Um, the older industrial buildings that are designated as special status sites in the development code, um, there's been some, some question because the current regulations are not very clear about what type of new businesses might be allowed to occupy those buildings. Um, and, and the rules are just, um, I think, troublesome for everyone to understand at this point. So the proposed amendments include clarifications that spell out what kind of businesses can be considered for those, um, for those special status sites. Um, and again, trying to make sure that people know going in, is my, is my business in this list or not? Um, and there would still be a conditional use review process to, for, for kind of major expansions or, or major changes to the type of business there, but it streamlines a little bit minor expansions and, and changes that are, um, don't change the broad use category. There's also um, proposed streamlining of process for businesses and uses that don't have a lot of impact or concern for the abutting properties. So allowing site plan review by staff versus going to planning commission for a conditional use review. Um, for example, um, in the waterfront zone for retail uses. And then um, as another obstacle to development, the um, existing development regulations require a lot of land for setbacks on certain properties and for um, parking if you are outside of the parking assessment district. And so um, because of what we heard about how those existing regulations are making development difficult or in some cases impossible on some of the smaller lots downtown, there are proposed amendments that would reduce the, um, the setback and parking requirements, particularly for smaller infill development. Um, in terms of how the development regulations would address attractive um, building form and attractive development, um, I think Bob touched on this, that it, it's important, the reason that this is important to the downtown is to protect the property value of the adjacent properties and to keep downtown overall a, a, an attractive and inviting place for people to come, to make it appealing for pedestrians, that's part of what makes downtown special and different is that it's a really, you know, it's a great place to walk around and not have to get back in your car. Um, and the, the other kind of key idea there um, is that about kind of providing public safety through eyes on the street. Um, this is a, a technique that's been demonstrated to reduce undesirable behavior by providing either the reality of or the perception of being observed by people in the building. And so that was an, an important piece of kind of that, um, what do we want the buildings to look like and how do we want them to be designed. Um, and then the other element of the um, kind of having attractive and desirable building form was how it relates to the historic character of the area. So trying to balance um, providing enough development potential to get development on vacant or underfilled properties, but also respecting the historic character um, within historic districts or next to um, designated landmarks. And then as Bob mentioned, kind of aligning the uses with the, with the goals of the zone. So um, I've mentioned one of these already, the places where we've streamlined, um, where there's a use that you know is pretty clearly in line with the goals of the zone, but was being reviewed at kind of with more process than it really needed. On the other side of that is uses that do have the potential for offsite impacts and aren't really central to the goals of the downtown zone. So manufacturing, as an example, can be appropriate, isn't always, probably needs a little bit of discretionary review to decide whether, the, whether it makes sense um, downtown and, and what kind of treatments it might need in order to be compatible. And then there are some uses that just 
don't really need to be downtown. They can be accommodated better in other parts of the city. So car dealerships and gas stations, as example. You know, you don't have them now. You don't necessarily need to permit them in the downtown. And so those uses are proposed to be prohibited. In terms of the, the clear and objective standards, Bob already mentioned that um, sometimes being more clear also means more words. So um, again, trying to say what is meant by some of the words, kind of trying to define terms clearly, trying to say how to measure things, again, with the idea that when an applicant comes in, they already understand the rules. They and staff will have the same understanding of what's required. There will not be a lot of surprises. There won't be a lot of redos on their part. It saves them time and money going through the process. Um, and at the same time, trying to make sure that where we're adding maybe more specific language, we're also adding purpose statements and being clear about how things apply so that a less technical reader can look at this and understand what is this trying to accomplish and is this going to apply to me? Um, and so trying to sort of balance that clarity but also you know, understanding the high level. For parking standards, um, the proposed amendments would um, really continue to put a priority on on-street parking and on shared public parking lots. Um, and so that means keeping the exemption from parking requirements within the parking assessment district, which is shown in red, that kind of red outline um, on the map up there, that's your parking assessment district. Existing um, re regulations do not require off-street parking within that area. Um, and also- Is that on a page in our agenda here? Yes, that is, we do have a version of that. One for the page, uh, page 130 actually has the black and white version of that it's parking assessment district. That's the version that's in the in the development code. So as Bob said, page 130 has, has that map. So um, another key piece of kind of emphasizing on-street and shared public parking is protecting the existing supply of on-street parking by <coughs> limiting driveways for residential development so that your on-street parking supply doesn't get converted into curb cuts that serve you know, maybe a single unit and get used only a portion of the day, um, but they remain available to everybody, for customers, for visitors, to downtown. Um, and, and can be more efficiently used over the course of the day. And then outside of the parking assessment district, outside of that red outline, um, the proposed amendments include a reduced parking ratio for most commercial and residential uses. For commercial uses, this is important both because um, it's helpful for new development and because it makes it a lot easier for a new business to come into an existing building there's not as much of a, you're l much less likely to have a problem where I can't put this use into this existing building because I can't meet the parking requirements. So that helps kind of um, make the existing buildings more viable. And then for um, small sites for new development, it just, it means that you're not trying to accommodate the full um, standard city parking requirements on these very small downtown sites where by the time you met your parking requirements, you wouldn't have space left for a building. Um, so again, it, it really emphasizes kind of those smaller sites and, um, and tries to provide uh, more of a parking reduction for smaller developments. In terms of matching regulations to the context, so there are two areas where zone changes are proposed. The new downtown mixed use zone is proposed for um, the areas outlined in black on this map. Again, the kind of that south um, west portion of what is currently the historic downtown zone. <coughs> the regulations of the downtown mixed use zone are very similar to the historic downtown zone, except that they allow more flexibility 
for residential uses and more flexibility on setbacks and windows. And that's reflecting kind of the character of that area that already has some residential buildings and a little bit more mixed um, styles of buildings. And then um, portions of the central business zone along Lyons are also proposed to be rezoned, they're supposed to be rezoned to the historic downtown zone. The intent there is to protect and reinforce the commercial character. This is a pretty key gateway to downtown. The central business district zone um, is proposed to get more flexible for residential than it is today. So as part of that, as sort of a trade-off for that, um, because this area wasn't identified as necessarily being appropriate for ground floor residential through the public process, um, applying the historic downtown zone kind of carries that commercial ground floor across line and, and creates that more um, continuous commercial area across to um, across about another half block to a block past Lion Street and then allows that mixed use development within the rest of that area. So as Bob mentioned, the Planning Commission um, went through this. They went through it in a lot of detail. We really appreciate the amount of time and effort that they put into reviewing and, and thinking about the details on this. Um, and they recommended some refinements. They're summarized in the staff report. Um, I have the page a second ago. They are on page 16 of your staff report. I'm gonna run through them just briefly. Um, and if there are questions or if there's anything that you want to discuss further, we're, we're happy to do that. As Bob mentioned, there were some things where they directed a pretty clear, specific change. Um, so clarifications on uh, wording in a couple of places just to make sure that the way that everyone was reading the requirements matched up to what was intended. And um, another one was to continue to require multifamily development to meet existing pedestrian connection standards that basically allow the city to require more connections to the sidewalk than what the basic building code would require. And then ensuring that development that fronts on first or second avenue even if it's on a corner even if it has multiple frontages that the, the side that faces first and second is always the priority for having the windows for having the you know the, the more interesting building facade whatever requirements we have about having an attractive face of the building that they always apply on first and second the other issues where they gave some direction, but um, there was a little bit left for staff to do to kind of implement that direction. Um, they wanted to see some more options and more flexibility for um, a proposed requirement to provide some landscaping between ground floor windows where there's ground floor residential. There's proposed to be a, um, a small landscape buffer in between any ground floor windows and the sidewalk and so they wanted to just see some more flexibility and options for what that landscaping is you know how many plants and, and all that just to not be too prescriptive and provide some flexibility there um, they wanted to clarify the language about ground floor window requirements for commercial and institutional development again just making sure that the way that um, the requirements were intended to work was more more focused on kind of being able to see out and um, and allowing some some flexibility there and then setbacks abutting uh, historic residential landmarks some of you will remember that um, the topic of setbacks next to residential uses <coughs> and zones is something that came up from the very beginning of this process and and has been a you know, balancing acts to try to find the right balance between the new development and the existing uses. So what went to the Planning Commission um, was limited to uh, where it is a historic landmark that was originally built for residential use. There are also setbacks abutting residential zones, but in terms of things that are in a mixed use zone, there was a, a setback proposed for where new development was abutting a historic residential landmark. And the, what the Planning Commission wanted to see was um, that that 
setback would only be required for developments that are kind of of a scale beyond what you would typically see in a historic residential <coughs> landmark building. So something taller than maybe three stories, that that would be where you would start to need to have a setback. So that smaller development, again, trying to make sure that small infill development has as much potential as it can on a small site. <coughs> can you tell us any examples of that problem? Um, uh, yeah, I think, and, and maybe Mr. Lettman will speak to it uh, a little bit later on, but um, I was, through different channels, uh, brought my attention to it, uh, the lot next to two lots down from the Fort Miller building next to the, um, the florist shop there. There's a vacant lot that, um, so you got a, a commercial building up front, the florist shop. Behind that, there's a, a historic house. Next to that is a vacant lot, and um, <clears throat> and that house that's there is set back from the property line. I don't know, maybe 13 or 15 feet, something like that. But that would be an example of um, this question of somebody wants to develop that vacant lot, and it's next to a building that is or could be used for residential use. Um, how, what setback do you apply? to this vacant lot, do you make them push back five feet of, or no feet, or if you do make them set back under what what circumstances would you require that setback? So that's, I, I've been trying to keep that, that um, that's an example that's clear in my mind of how that might work, and there could be some others. And, and that, the starting place for this is the currently, it's a one foot setback per one foot of building height for anything that is an existing residential use, and so, the question has been, do you completely eliminate that requirement? Do you keep a small setback for certain circumstances? And so that's kind of where the conversation has been. It's just, is it zero? Is it sometimes a setback? Is it always a setback? Is it you know, smaller? Um, so that's that was one place where they their recommendation, again, was to focus it to development, but to, to think about scale, the scale of the new development, and to only require a setback for larger and taller buildings. Their last one that they kind of gave direction without a real, uh, without seeing specific language come out of it was to modify the reductions on required parking. So as I mentioned, the proposed amendments include parking reductions for most commercial and residential development outside the parking assessment district. And they supported that recommendation, but they wanted to kind of put some bookends on it for very large development, for things with more than a few bedrooms, and to sort of make sure that it was focused to its intended purpose of um, enabling the smaller infill development, but that it wouldn't become a huge problem if there were a very large development kind of different from what was envisioned. And so that's one where um, it working with staff, we had to kind of come up with, with what those bookends what that bookend would be, what the threshold would be, where they would get, you know, more of a reduction or less of a reduction, and so that's one that the planning commission did not provide a specific threshold that they recommended, but they set that direction that let's let's not give as much of a reduction for a really large development. The number that's in there now is 70 units. That's about on the scale of a full block development and might you know use up about the on-street parking on a whole block so that's about the scale that where the threshold is set now but it's it's a um that that's kind of something where the planning commission didn't set that number specifically and, and they kind of forwarded the, the general recommendation they also had questions about um, proposed changes to the garage setback there's a proposed amendment that would allow garages to be set back five feet or 20 feet. Right now it's just 20 feet. And so that five foot option, some, some members of the Planning Commission had questions and concerns about that. We had some good discussion about it. They ultimately recommended approval as is, but they did want to flag that for your consideration. So, the um, Planning Commission and staff found that the, in total, the, the proposed package of amendments is consistent 
with all of the review criteria and did recommend approval. Um, but we are happy to take any questions that you have because I know there's a lot of detail here that we've lost it. And, and I'll just mention real quick too that there are two pieces of written testimony um, that were received after the staff report was printed, and those are um, at your chairs. Okay. All right, Rich, you had a question. <clears throat> Windows. Originally, um, my understanding is the window uh, requirement was driven by. Uh, needs for downtown to not have the tunnel effect. Um, only it was not just put on downtown, it was put on a lot more. So we have requirements now in, well, Winco, uh, et cetera, had to have a certain amount of windows. Um, now we're finding that, in fact, that is an onerous problem, and we're deleting or modifying that for the certain sections of downtown. All sections of downtown? Or just just the one? Would you like clarification on that? Yes. Um, the window requirements are not proposed to be deleted for any of the zones downtown. They're proposed to be reduced slightly in the central business district and the downtown mixed use zone would have a lower standard than they currently have today with the historic downtown, but they would both still be above any of the other zones besides the, H, the historic downtown zone. And Councillor Kellum, if I could respond to the, the WINCO, I think that was what you, you prefaced your question with. Um, in that particular development, um, the, the code currently has a requirement that commercial buildings that front a street or that, that are but a street are required to have um, a, a window. And in, in that particular development, the building faced uh, the parking lot, which was acceptable. The code permitted that. He said if you face the parking lot, that's where your storefront could be, so on and so forth. So that was all per code. And um, there was a requirement that on the street facing side of that building that they had to have a window, and it was actually a window, one window, which the, which the developer proposed. And um, the, the issue was really, as I recall it, that the, the person appealing that development said that the window didn't allow enough light through. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a burden on the developer, it was used more from the <laughs> from the appellant as a way to, to slow the development down. And so they did and I, I understand that. I guess I used Winco because it's the latest one. Yeah. Uh, AutoZone, um, you see windows on the street uh, with stuff in back of them that you, you're not looking at the store, you're just looking into some display that they have there because, well, they had to put windows in. Um, my question, question that comes up for me is if this is a problem downtown where it was proposed why don't we simply modify it for everybody um, I, I, well I guess I, I, I'm not sure and, and, and maybe I, I guess what I'm not sure about is, is if there if it was a problem I think what we're proposing is to sort of change those percentages. Um, right now in the historic downtown zone, I think the requirement is for 75% windows. In some of the other areas, we're proposing to reduce it. And so maybe your question is, if we're proposing to reduce it in some of these other areas, why not everywhere Just else? everywhere. Yeah, and, I, and I'll let Becky jump in, but I, <laughs> I should probably say it better than I can. But I think one of the one of the reasons, that's something that could be considered with a, with a future set of, uh, of amendments we were limited to looking just at this, these three zones. That was just the, the scope of what we could work on with this project. And, and as a result, um, the only things really that we're able to change are things that affect these well, zones. And you can but you made another that. zone. With that? You made another zone. We made zone. another zone, yeah. yeah. Um, and if well, we were to, we, yeah, so we just had a, 
we had a limit what we could do. And so if that's something that, that the, the council would like us to consider, we can certainly consider that, but just in the next set of amendments. Um, well, it's been my experience happens. that the next set of amendments tends to be out there someplace, uh -huh. and many times it just doesn't happen. Well, yes, yeah, I think you know, we do have a list of amendments uh, that, you know, that we're tracking, yeah. but, but you're right, there, yeah. there's no particular timeline. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to add that notice, for example, has not gone out to anybody who might be in a different zone. They would not be aware. It, it, if um, that standard were to be amended for other zones and other places, you would have to then re-notice and, and notice all of those property owners to let them know that something was changing. Um, so just, again, because of the scope of this project and the kind of limited geographic boundary, um, we try to be very careful throughout the project not to make changes that would, that would affect what somebody would have to do, what their answer would be as a counter, what standards would apply to them that were outside of this area. And this area does still, across the board, have um, at least as high a standard as the rest of the city. The waterfront zone is consistent with some of the commercial zones, but the ones that we changed, they, they are still above any other commercial zone in the city. So they haven't been reduced below what the expectation is for the rest of the city. They're still above. They just came down slightly from where they where they are today. Okay. Any other questions of staff <coughs> regarding the staff report, Dick? I, uh, you've mentioned streamlining two or three times. And does that just kick us completely out of the loop? Or can people apply and appeal to the council? Um, the, the places where we're using that term streamlining, um, it refers to a time when we're going to um, make something a site plan review permit application as opposed to a conditional use application. I think those are the, I think it's usually the, always or always like a conditional use to site plan review. A site plan review application is a staff level decision and um, those can be appealed um, Typically, those are can be those are appealed directly to Luba unless there's a neighborhood uh, meeting that's required for them. So, um, in those cases, uh, there wouldn't be a planning commission or city council review. It would be staff level that would be appealed to Luba. Um, other cases, though, we're going the other direction, where things that or uses that um, that staff and planning commission agree to and have identified as um, potentially creating negative compatibility impacts that were done at a site plan review, we're proposing that those be considered through a conditional use, which in those, um, if it's a type three conditional use application, those start out with a planning commission review and can be appealed to the city council. So um, we can explore that in a place to, to look um, <coughs> For those changes that you just placed, and we can walk through this tonight or some other time, is Table 5 2, um, which is uh, on page 62, 60, oh, 1. 5 1 of um, it, which is a schedule of uses, and it, and it identifies the uses and the permit process that they have to go through. Well, I guess I don't feel very good about staff doing things that the public can't appeal to. Well, the elected officials that might be a little more sensitive or know something about the neighborhood or that kind of thing, that staff might not be aware of or sure. I'm sensitive to. Yeah, and I, you know, I... We're the ones that have to go out to the public every so often and say, how are we doing? say, well, we like what you're doing, or they you know, get out of here. Right. I understand that. And um, it, we aren't changing the anything related to the, the appeal processes. Um, so in other words, today, um, site plan review applications, um, unless there's a neighborhood meeting, and, and David, correct me if I'm wrong here, but unless there's a neighborhood meeting, um, site plan review decisions that are made by staff um, the appeal goes to the land use board of appeals. 
and it doesn't go back to the Planning Commission or City Council. So we're not proposing any changes with that, with that appeal process. Um, that's something, again, that, that the council may want to consider um, to, to make sure you know, any decision that's made locally could potentially go be funneled up through city council. But that's not how it is today, and we aren't proposing any changes with that, with that appeal process. Well, I guess I personally would like to see anything that a person disagrees with come to the uh, planning division or the council before it goes off to the state someplace. <coughs> That, that's my feeling. I don't know about the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Staff? Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, now we'll be taking public testimony. And as I recognize you, please come to the podium, state your full name and address, spell your last name, and make any comments you may have with the council's consideration. If anyone wishes to enter an exhibit into the record as part of your testimony, please briefly describe it and then present it to the city clerk. So first, we had a couple people that did sign up. And um, first, we have is Nancy um, DeMossi. I think this was over the other. She was here for the other hearing. Yeah, that was for the, um, the other hearing, so. OK, so Scott. You're up. And I handed up um, um, testimony from Scott earlier, so that should be at your at your seats. And so, which was this sheet here, though, that was handed uh, out? Um, I believe that's also from from Scott and this uh, starts out provision of restrictive height requirements in the DMU zone. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, um, my name is Scott Lippman. Uh, my office is 100 Ferry Street, Albany, Oregon. I'm Candace Rivera, and I work for Scott. And my address is 100 Ferry Street, Northwest. Um, I want to commend the staff, as well as Becky and Bob, uh, and this process uh, as we evolve through this. Uh, I know their objectives are different than a developer's interest, um, but what I was hoping for was that um, there would be flexibility in the code that allow uh, investment in downtown Albany, um, and then investment, most importantly, is bank capital. Um, if you can't create value out of the property, then you can't uh, finance it, and if you can't finance it, it won't be built. Um, we have a handout uh, response to Central Albany Code Amendments, and um, I think we handed it out to everyone, and I, I believe we should have probably put it on the monitor so everyone in the audience could see, but um, we, we just had a handout. On the second page, you'll see Info Hub, um, and you'll see um, some addresses. Um, there's 420, um, which is a building we have under renovation right now. 302 is the Carnegie Library. Uh, the 432 is a property that is a lot that we're hoping to develop. Under the current zoning guidelines, and one of the reasons what prompted us to contact staff is um, because there's a, a residence on lot 313, um, we have to have a setback uh, one foot for every one foot of building height. The lot of 432 is 40 feet wide. We plan on putting a three-story building there, minimum 30 feet tall. So the setback on that lot would be 30 feet on a 40-foot um, wide lot. Um, if you look on the next page, um, the the revisions uh, have gotten better. And, um, but you'll notice that we have this white area here. Um, and that is the proposed setback for the residents at, um, on the corner of, of uh, the alley and 313 um, Washington. 
That's, that's only if the building's over 30 feet. Um, and I noticed in the um, Planning Commission's recommendations uh, on page 16, it says modify interior setbacks to require setbacks abutting historic residential buildings in mixed use zones only for large scale new buildings over 30 feet tall. And the concern we have is um, we couldn't address it with the Planning Commission is that a 30 foot high building is 35, 30 feet high at the eave, not at the peak. Um, and, uh, and so we would like to suggest that it be just a three story building as opposed to a 30 foot tall building. Um, in the we have some pictures of the the residents at 313 Washington. There's a front photograph, an alley view uh, of the uh, property. There's another front view of the property. There's a rear view of the property. And uh, there's a rear corner view of the property. And then there's the um, rear setback for the dwelling from the property line. The telephone pole is the approximate location of the property line. We believe that the um, setback from the property line to this historic dwelling is 14 feet, 13 feet. And under the proposed guidelines, though they want to take uh, or will be restricted from building another five feet on our property to protect that setback. Uh, if we're not above, uh, we can't build 35 feet. So, so what we're requesting um, um, is that recognize that the height restriction of 30 Street does not provide for uh, the construction of a three-story building. Uh, the maximum height in this zone is 65 feet. We suggest the height restriction be raised to 35 feet without a setback from the property line. So just a five foot of distance. Um, the next page is, we have is the building, with the aerial photograph on page uh, don't have the pages fascinated, so that makes it fun. Um, it's the page after the photo of the east rear corner. Yes. Shows, uh, depicts uh, a lot as kitty corner from the courthouse. It's outlined in red. If you look at that, it's um, addressed at 328 Ferry Street. If you look at this, there's a garage at the northwest corner that appears to be at the property line. And um, if you go follow that property line south, there's an office building, and these are right across the alley from us, um, that is at 433. It's uh, Scott Norman's law firm uh, building. And, and here's those garages right here, and there's the alley opposite this property. And here is the picture. I don't know exactly where the um, property line is, but either the office building or the garages are on the property line or close to the property line. Then there's a picture of the attorney's office, um, and then adjacent to the attorney's office on Washington Street is an older historic building at 439 Fourth Avenue. And if you look at the setbacks from the um, uh, historic building from the alley point of view, it looks like the office building is built on the property line uh, because the setback, uh, the historic setback from the historic dwelling is a five foot setback. And then uh, you can, on the walkway um, between 433 and 439 4th Avenue, you can see the stairwell on the property line, and then in the distance, you can see that uh, 
historic structure uh, that had the 14, six, 14 foot setback from our property. Um, the Fort Miller building, the wall height, which actually goes clear up to the roof line, is 34 to 35 feet high. And that's what we were intending to build originally, was to match the height of the Fort Miller building with the town hall. Um, we drove around in historic Bonchit district and within a couple of blocks, we found many of the homes that ranged in 36 to 42 feet in height. Uh, and those are what the following pictures are of the homes that we found um, down in Forest, 6 and 7 Avenue. And there were other ones that, that we didn't take pictures of. Um, it, it's my belief that if we had a little bit more time with the planning commission or with staff, uh, we could address these before we got to the council. Um, the We have a site plan for a property on Southeastern, and uh, the lot is 72 feet wide. And we have a proposed elevation of what we're proposing to build the same one uh, we've had a few, for a few years. Um, it's designed by Mr. Riles, uh, architect in Albany, who's in the audience. Um, the concern we have is this is right across the street from the uh, employment office for, uh, I think, Lynn and Benton counties. And at night, this um, uh, area is pretty vacant. Um, I don't imagine that the use would be changing much, but the concern we have, uh, in other words, in my opinion, there's ample parking there. Um, one of the provisions uh, uh, that concern us regarding this development is um, the uh, curb cuts. So we're proposing to build these four townhomes, and that conflicts with the um, uh, current uh, proposed code uh, to restrict the number of curb cuts or driveways. But the idea being is that uh, to make it more pedestrian friendly. Um, the staff has um, accommodated that by incorporating in the language, um, I believe I'm 76. I think it's 76. This one. Okay. Well, um, where the there is provision in there that allows uh, this comment that um, we're reasonably feasible. Where we are. Okay, on page 79, excuse me. Um, so if you turn to the, the proposed code on page 79, um, it gives an example of our four townhomes. Um, and it says flexibly is provided through the use of where reasonably feasible so that standards do not preclude access to individual properties to make developments impossible. So that was fine, but it's still a concern if um, when that's interpreted by a future staff member, uh, what that means. So. Um, and I'll the give you a little. Problem, the real problem is, is that the staff has said 25 feet of separation between driveways in this particular property and on the property on Southwest Third. The buildings are only 18 and 20 feet wide, which means that the garage takes up 12 feet. So the most that you could have 
between two driveways would be 16 feet. And that's on the largest lot, the 72 foot wide lot that he wants to develop with eight units. Um, so that is the problem, is that if you're going to develop a townhouse situation and the units are not wide units, you can't meet that standard at all. And in, in the process of doing this, this is a 72-foot wide lot, so basically you could have two and a half, almost three parking spaces, but in this proposed development, each of the eight units will have a parking space. So you're gaining parking in this area and not losing parking, even though it's not on-street parking. It is, the parking is being provided for the units. The um, the dilemma that or the discussion that uh, contemplate is uh, the developer me is trying to get the maximum utility out of the property, um, and I think the staff is weighing the, what impacts that has on uh, the use the businesses or pedestrians and. Um, but this is a concern that affects our ability to develop this property. So, thank you very much. Any questions of Scott? Yeah, right. Well, more of uh, staff or council when we get to that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that it? Okay, thank you, Scott and Candice. And the pictures of the house that you showed that was on Washington, is that occupied or a vacant house? Uh, it's a occupied house. It's occupied. Yeah. Okay. Scott, can, can I just recap the, the two points that you made? Uh, sorry, no, here. Sorry. Uh, the, the two issues, one being that the 30-foot the height might not be tall enough, and you were suggesting 35 feet, and then there's a concern about the 25-foot wide driveway separation. Were those that, I mean, I know you walked through some of the other pictures, but I just want to make sure I'm capturing the, those were the two major points. Okay. Yeah, that's the, yeah, we went, uh, or Candace went through, and uh, that's what we did. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right, Bill, you're next. Thank you, Madam Mayor. City Council, my name is Bill Riles, R-Y-A-L-S. I live at 935 Jones Avenue Northwest in Albany. Uh, first, I would like to do the same thing that Scott did, is deeply give my thanks to Becky and to Bob for this whole effort and the amount of time. I know it's been a long time. I, both being uh, the chairman of Landmarks Committee and being an architect locally, I've been asked to, to contribute a, a lot in this process, and I just want to say that I was a little skeptical going in, but it has been just a fantastic process. They really listened, and they've had an incredible balancing act, and I think they've done a really wonderful job. Uh, I think listening to Rich's comments and Dick, as well as Scott's, I think I think there's sort of a common thread to those things. and. It's inherent in the process of writing a code where you've got to come up with some sort of rules and they have to be clear and easy to understand. But the problem is you're, you're sort of writing a set of rules for the perfect world. In the perfect world, we do this and we'd have it this high and we'd do all that. Well, it's not a perfect world out there. And maybe it would cover 80% of your projects, but there will always be some outliers with difficulties uh, that, that need to be addressed or particularly addressed. And I think Dick's issue as well, maybe, you know, very many times talking to staff, I'm, I understand that staff is kind of tied sometimes by the code. <clears throat> and they don't have any choice but to decide in a certain way. And then Dick's concern is, well, they decide that way and suddenly it's off to Luba. And how did that happen? Uh, Rich's point about other parts of the district, I mean, that wasn't part of this study, so it's a little bit outside of that, but I totally appreciate where he's coming from because uh, 
there's a rule about the amount of windows that need to be to, in order to increase curb appeal and all that. Some cases that makes great sense. Some of that, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this myself, we end up putting in the windows and just throwing a sign behind it and we're really sort of skirting the issue. So uh, all this is a premise to uh, what I think the next step in this process is to look at uh, historically, we had a code, we lived by those rules, and then there was uh, a way for to make adjustments and there was a way to make variances. And the code the way it is written now in sort of the, the more uh, basic part of the code makes uh, me coming to staff or to the planning commission with a variance very, very difficult. And so I think if that process for Say, okay, here are these set of, sets of rules. We all agree this is a good balancing act. It's not perfect, but you know we're protecting the public. We're protecting. We're helping private investors. Uh, they're not going to be perfect. And then there is a fairly good process in place for minor adjustments. Up to 10% of almost any rule can be can be attained. But the 10% wouldn't help Scott with his parking issue or his building height probably. I mean, with 10%, he could get up to 33. And that one in particular, what you would see happen is that you'd get just a bunch of flat roofs. I mean, we, that would be an unintended consequence. We'd like to see, I know you're familiar with um, Woodwind Square, uh, or Woodwind Apartments on Salem Avenue, and what we did there and why they're so charming is that we went with a 12-12 roof. Well, it sort of pushed the height up, but it really made the buildings more friendly. So height isn't always an enemy. So I would just encourage, I, I, I know this was a long drawn out process and it cost a little money, but I really think it's step one uh, and it, it looked at some of the areas that were the most problematic in terms of infill development, but there are issues across the code and I think the next step that council should consider is to look at the ability to, to for, for me or any developer to come in and say, here's what the code says, here's what the staff says it means. We would like to propose a variance. It, you know, an adjustment is easy. Hopefully most of the time you could get what you needed to have with an adjustment. And a variance is a bigger deal. It should be a higher bar. We should, as an applicant, you should be able to prove why you need this variance. And I really trust both the Planning Commission and the staff and your decisions uh, to, to make your way through that. And, and I think if, it's, if there's an easy process for me to come to you with a variance and to prove my case and to go through staff and to go through Planning Commission and maybe ultimately end up here, uh, I'm good with that. I won't win all of them. Some of them I will. And I think it's just, it just feels more fair that uh, because every property is different and every situation is different. And um, it also would give staff some tools I think that they don't have now. If, if I come to them and say, well, I really would like this, then they can push back and say, well, we'll give you that, but how about giving something else? You know, give the public a little more or something. It, it, it makes it a little bit of a negotiation, and I think in some cases both sides can win in that process. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just, again, I want to thank staff. I want to thank Becky and her team. I want to thank all of you for this process, uh, and that's it. Okay. All right, Dale. I, I like that suggestion, though. So, um, pretty much in these zones, you know, in the historic district, then would be we have this, we have the code, the standard across the whole area, but then have a process for variances when it comes to you know specific type, challenging type lots. That's a good suggestion. So, um, see if staff is that something that would work in this type of process, do you think? Um, it's th the idea that, that Bill has just raised is something that staff is actively exploring. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, at some point, I'd like to have a conversation with, with City Council in, in, in more detail. But um, in concept, I think that's something that uh, is a good idea. And we probably are going to be pushed to do anyway from state law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, that was exactly the issue I was going to was going to raise on the variances. But I was intrigued by your comment. Why do you believe that with if this was implemented, why doing a variance would be more difficult than it is now? Well, it's difficult now. 
is the issue. But I inferred then, you said that it was going to be more difficult if these were in place. I didn't mean to say that. I, I think that the, the issue of the variances being difficult is when we have now, if anything, this recent go around has made it better. Okay. Thank you. So do you think with the, what we're presently proposing, there are fewer rules and it's easier to make changes? Yes, I think that this has been a very good process. It, it hasn't been perfect. And uh, I guess I could spend a little more time. I think it's been a very beneficial outcome for both the, the citizens of Albany and for mm -hmm. the potential developers. Um, you know, you, you ask early on, well, can you show me an example? And I would say, well, just walk around and every vacant lot is probably an example of what's wrong with the code. Why is there a vacant yeah. lot sitting there? It probably has some underlying issue that has made it difficult to develop. Yeah, and uh, my observation is that as time goes along, we uh, work on our development code and we work on our zoning ordinance. And it seems like we have zones and then we have more zones, and then we have sub-zones, and we have special rules. Pretty soon, it seems to me, you're going to look at every single property and say, okay, this has to be exactly this, that, or the other thing. And the owner says, well, wait, I want to do something. Um, I'd like to do something else than exactly that. And you got all these rules, and you can't change them. The only thing you do is go to loop. And well, Luba looks at the rules, they all you got to do exactly what, what all those regulations, specifications, and, and requirements say you've got to do. That, that and it leaves no room for uh, judgment or adjustment by the Planning Commission and or the Council. And uh, it seems like we end up kind of hogtied. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I... That, that I'd was, like to think about it. Yeah, that was why I was skeptical going into this. Every time we rewrite the code, yeah, yeah. it seems we do it with great intention, but it comes out more complicated at the end. I think this time, and that's why I really am serious when I... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not complaining about the suggestion here. I'm just yeah. uh, but I'm I think kind, you're, kind of you're, hesitant to leap into it. You're absolutely right. I'll, you just can med, you could weigh it going back in time and look at the codes were thinner and smaller yeah. and simpler. And yeah, had, they seem to do okay. We had single family housing, we had medium density, and then we had apartments. Now we leap from single family housing to four story apartments. I wonder, how did that happen? Yeah, I think part of it is response to state and to the ability for people to appeal things. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're absolutely right, and I think the feeling both in the development community and even in the community at large is let's simplify these things. Let's make it easier for people. Uh, if, if you want to do something, you shouldn't have to hire someone like me to be able to explain to you what it is you need to do. And that was one of the primary objectives of this process, and I think as difficult as it is, I think they did a good job. and, and a, Reach that I'm not arguing that, but I am, I am arguing that um, wouldn't it be nice to just avoid the city council, the, the developers say. Yeah. And um, I hate to see a slide into that. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, okay, that was it that signed up. Was there anyone else that um, would like to testify on the proposed amendments? Okay. And, and Mayor, I, I know I said this earlier, but um, the, there's the two pieces of testimony, and one of them I just want to uh, re um, point out, especially because there it's a person who uh, is looking at redeveloping the building. I just I don't want that to get lost, and they were they had some concerns with some of the regulations, so I just wanted you to. Be aware of that um, and be, before you continue on. Okay. All right. Did um, did staff have anything else that you wanted to respond on the testimony? Or um, I mean, I you know the the public hearing is still open, and I think council. I mean, there is a lot to absorb. I don't know if you've got a lot of questions through um, all of the code changes. If you wanted to continue. Um, the public hearing or keep the record open that's an option and we can have it scheduled for another meeting or work session if you wanted to go through things more in detail 
Yeah, Bill. I guess my thoughts are that we've got some areas we want to develop. There's people that are willing to develop them, but they have some issues with these proposed changes. And it would seem reasonable to me to have staff take a look at these suggestions. There's the third one for our guys from WDC Properties and see if there's some reasons to change or make some adjustments and, and bring it back to council. Yeah. To just, to just pass this tonight, it doesn't seem to accomplish what we want to accomplish. I mean, then the properties have some issues and, and possibly aren't developable and and you have the same concerns. Why is this property sitting vacant? Why doesn't somebody develop it? You know, well, we've become our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, we're happy to do that. Um, some of these issues um, uh, we've heard and, and we can respond to them this evening if you'd like. Um, uh, we, we don't have a, a specific formal response, but I think the, the, the request, um, you know, going from 30 feet to 35 feet, it's uh, it's something that's 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 possible. Um, it's 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 simply a matter of it's it's a policy question really about whether or not uh, that's the right height and um, whether there's a. You know, I'm, I'm referring to the you know building on a vacant lot next to a residential uh, house and um, or a historic residential building, and so you know that's something that that's easily can be considered this evening. And um, because it is sort of a policy, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to that. It's uh, what what do we all think, or what does the council think is the best balance of protecting one property versus the, another property? Um, and then I think we can also uh, give a shot tonight to respond to um, the reasons for the the proposed amendments regarding the um, the driveway separation that Mr. Um, Letman raised. And um, so I think we can, res we can respond to that tonight, and we also can certainly come back uh, another time with a, uh, if you'd like, a written response to that, that specific thing or a written response to the, the height um, request to increase the height of that, those buildings. Um, we can certainly do that, and, um, and we could come back and, and speak a little bit more about the, the issue raised in written testimony regarding live work units and why we arrived at the proposed amendments that we have and what that might mean for um, this person uh, who submitted the written testimony. So uh, either way, we can respond partially tonight and come back again at another meeting, or we can simply wait and do it all again another evening. It's up, it's up to I, you. To me, it seems like there is a lot of questions and answers. If we can sort of get them, um, you yeah. know, what the testimony was and what was raised in written form um, on it. And, and also, if we did go with the variance process, because I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing the words flexible. I don't, I don't like words like that in our codes unless it's just clear and objective. But if we did have that variance process, would we be able to eliminate those words in the code? So, um, and maybe get a response back to us of pros and cons over having that variance process on that. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I, um, I see. Uh, Jim Delacour is good. Well, yeah. I, I would defer to Cal for Fife. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a short explanation of the timeline that, or basically the amount of time that has been spent from the start of this project to now? Has it been a year? Has it been six months? I think it's been about a year and a half. It's been a year and a half. It's been below, before Planning Commission. It's been reviewed there. I assume that notices have been sent out to all property owners, yes, am I sir. correct? So now all of a sudden at the tail end of this process, we're starting over again. We've got to, we've got to amend this and amend this and amend all these other things. When I'm thinking in my, my own small mind that uh, that should have been taken care of a long time before it got to this process, I'm just, you know, thinking out loud that all of those concerns and problems should have been addressed before it got to this point where it wouldn't have had to have a continuance. And I'm just kind of confused where the disconnect happened um, and why that was, why, why these concerns, valid concerns, weren't brought up six, eight months ago. And now we're dealing with it again and now we're starting 
we're starting the process. It seems to me we're starting the process over again and we're not getting anywhere. We're stuck in the mud. Can anybody help me with that? Uh, I can take a, take a shot at it. Okay. And, um, uh, when we go through these processes of uh, evaluating and, and amending the development code, it's, it's, uh, it's a conversation. It's an iterative process. There's a lot of back and forth and as as we come up with one solution, it creates another concern, and we address that concern, it can create another another problem, and um, and so it's it's kind of an ongoing conversation, and, um, and the, the folks who presented the testimony this evening have been part of that conversation from the very beginning, and um, the the issue that um, that they raised, uh, for example, I think we've heard two um, two issues this evening. One regarding um, the height of that building, uh, whether it should be 30 feet or 35 feet. That's something, um, the 30 foot uh, height limit is in response to testimony we received um, through the planning commission process. So we've made, a, we've made a change to try to address that particular issue and now they're, they're suggesting, well, maybe that's not quite enough, maybe we should do something else. So we can consider that. Um, the, the driveway separation um, issue is something else that's, that's been um, kind of part of the conversation uh, for um, the last uh, few months at least. And uh, when we're looking at the changes to the development code, we're, we're also trying to think of, about the objectives that were in place that we were trying to follow, which is to, um, uh, you know, we're concerned about parking and making sure there's ample on-street parking and providing a, a, you know, a safe and attractive pedestrian environment. So we're balancing some of those those kind of broader goals against um, a, a particular development site of uh, that's there's not an application and yet there's a concept. So I think the question for, for the council is, you know, how, how to balance all of those things, balance the, the, the big picture objectives against the, the individual um, concept on one particular lot. And like I said before, there's not necessarily a single right answer to any of this. No, I understand that. But if they've been involved in the process since the beginning, which started approximately a year, year and a half ago, and there's still concerns that they're bringing up so they're able to develop the property, why weren't those concerns put into this document before it got to this point? I don't understand that, did what was missed. If they're involved in the process, and now we're down to the point where we're gonna vote on something to amend the code, and they're still bringing up issues that should have been addressed, before the planning commission, before it got here, I don't understand the disconnect. They okay. they were addressed with the planning commission, and the planning commission didn't uh, they didn't rec they didn't um, recommend approval of their request. So that the particular issue that they raised with the driveway separation, for example, that was considered by the planning commission, and the planning commission heard that, and their recommendation was to uh, <coughs> go forward with the with the, the amendments as you see in your, in your packet. It just seems like we're stuck in the mud. Okay, that's mm -hmm. where I'm at. Yeah, yeah, Rich? I don't have a problem extending the time. What I do have issue with is, while it's been alluded to a couple of three times, I don't know the guy on, the, on that street corner that has the house, um, I don't know them. I don't know what their needs are, what their aspirations are. Um, we hear that the people next door need to have some space. And we hear that from Scott. And we, we hear it from developers over and over. What we don't seem to hear is the guy who's next door, who's the little guy, mm -hmm. who has the space. And there doesn't seem to be a mechanism by which that guy can make a deal with Scott that says, you know, I'm 73 years old and, and my kids don't want this place and, you know, I want to you know, give me a dollar forty-seven and, you know, build it right on the property line. But we, the people involved are not the ones who get to make the decision. And that concerns me because they're 
you have two opposing needs many times. The guy who lives there, it's his property. He's, you know, if you're going to change the, the designation, um, I mean, my, my property was changed from commercial to light industrial. And in the process, the value of it went down by so many thousand dollars. Nobody gave me any money for it. They just decided, you know, that doesn't fit anymore. Well, I paid for commercial property. I didn't get to have commercial property when it was done. And I don't hear the concern for that little guy that we have all been who do not have the ability to, to get a hold of someone to explain the system because they don't have the money. Or, I mean, I, I have a very good friend who lives out, out west of Philomon. And what he ended up doing, he had 60 some odd acres and he wanted to put two houses on it. And he could buy a little bit more from somebody else. And Benton County says, no, 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 no. What he did was he hired a guy that used to work for Benton County that knew where all the niches and all the little goodies went and, and so would go in and speak the language of the people involved and got them to change their mind. 95% of people do not have the ability to do that. Um, Scott does because Scott, been in business a long time, knows all the folks. And don't misunderstand, I don't begrudge you doing that. That's not... You know. Yeah. But but the point there being, the little guy on the corner, or the the guy in North Albany whose house is right next to what could be 30, 50, 27 feet tall, right on the property line. All he can do is complain, and there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for that guy to be able to walk up to the developer and say, listen, let's do something. Right, so I think that kind of leads to is if we maybe had staff come back as some sort of variance process. One that, I mean, the, the whole downtown district is very unique. Every pro, it's not a cookie cutter type, you know, land use, you know, um, development. And if there's, you know, a variety of lot sizes, different types of uses, and that's where if we had sort of a process um, for variants that wouldn't be a real cumbersome type process something that we can take that unique piece of where maybe Somebody doesn't mind, you know having a different setback on their property Allowing it something that would be you know a more simpler type process. So um, Would council like staff to kind of bring Something back a concerned yeah. look on his face. Jeff, no, not yeah. concerned at all. I'm, I'm eager actually <laughs> um, Just I'll just remind Council that we a um, month or two back we had a, our kind of our first round of discussions about an overall code audit and some other recommendations that came out of our interviews with the development community, uh, with uh, developer representatives, uh, planning commission, and then also your input. And we we went through a laundry list of improvements that we thought the overall code uh, might need to consider or that needed. And one of those items was what we term a two-track system, where you have uh, very clear and objective standards, where if, if you happen to be one of those lucky property owners that fits that cookie-cutter example, you come in, you check the boxes, and you get your approval. And if you don't fit into that scenario, there's another track where there's more discretion and flexibility that's able to be exercised, and that can then go the route of um, say the planning commission and, and um, whether you're the neighboring property owner or whether you're the developer there's an opportunity to discuss the pros and the cons and the trade-offs uh, and those decisions can be made in that way when we went through that prioritization effort with you uh, that was one of the items that scored the highest as far as uh, priority for council and a place to expend our our energy in pursuing and in, in our next code audit effort so that is something that's on the radar that's something the, the scoring of the priorities is something that we'll be coming back to you with something that uh, Bob and I are both excited about getting implemented uh, but it is separate from this project this project uh, was uh, funded by Kara Holy if I remember correctly uh, and was funded 
bike era in an effort to focus on these limited areas. And so that we've really tried to stay true to that uh, because it was a different, it wasn't planning department's money that we were spending in that project. So um, I think Bill articulated the, the situation very well. And um, so I, I think we that's in motion. Okay, yeah. So, right, right. We'll be back to you in the next couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, to Mike's point, some of the discussions we've had over the years I've been on board, it, it's getting to the point, it's almost Kafkaesque, if the name Kafka means anything to you, uh, to anybody. Uh, what happens if we get to the next meeting and another developer comes to us and says, well, wait a minute, what about these particular properties? I've got some issues here, why don't we make some changes? And it's almost a never-ending cycle. At some point, you've got to say, okay, here's where it stops right now. Now we can come up with a process by which we can come up with some more clean, effective ways to do a variance uh, that are streamlined and, and move it forward. But there's got to be a, a, an end game, a finality to it. Otherwise, it, we can just be here, audit them. If Ryan knows. The, uh, you know, the magnitude of the issues that were evaluated with this work effort are much greater than what was summarized at a high level today. Uh, I think people were, the people that testified were, were genuine in their, in their statements about being pleased with the progress that had been made to this point. The, the purpose of a public hearing is, is to receive input on areas where there's differences of opinion that, from what staff had brought forward. As, as Bob noted there's not a right or wrong answer and staff I mean, for those of you that, that were able to attend the joint work session with landmark scara uh, planning commission and council to talk about these code amendments you heard all the folks around the table with drastically different opinions on on any one issue and try to reach consensus so we're getting we've tried to build that consensus which means there are still people that disagree with certain portions of the language and and uh, we've tried to, to work collaboratively with folks that have concerns to, to get to being able to, to build what they want to build. And um, I'm sure Bob will be able to share an opinion as, as to whether he, he has a strong opinion of whether the changes they propose are, are significant or not. But I think we're doing pretty good if we're down to three issues at, at, the, at the first public hearing with council, just based on my past well, public hearings I've sat through. <laughs> three the chair. So, so seeing the, the time then, um, and we've got a long agenda here to take care of folks, are you okay about having this come back? Yes. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that, uh, and I'll have to apologize, I mean, that I hadn't, haven't studied this uh, as much as I should have. And we had an eclipse on Monday, and I was expecting somewhere between 20 and 30 people to descend on my my home, all relatives. You know, I, uh, um, I invited my kids. And then one of my brothers uh, called up and he said, you know, you're gonna have an eclipse down there. And he was hinting around, the boy, I'm sure I'd like to come down and see the eclipse. And I said to him, you know, Albany and the whole area is gonna be a real zoo down here. Well, it didn't turn out that way. It was really pretty calm. Uh, but I uh, discouraged him from uh, coming down. And uh, my uh, fr good friend Catherine said, I told her about it. She said, you shouldn't have done that. That's your brother. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, uh, we, can, we can figure out something. So I, uh, call, I called him back and I said, uh, you know, I, sh I shouldn't have discouraged you from coming. And, and uh, no, come on down. Okay, great. He said, I'll call the family. Well, he's got three <laughs> daughters and they're all married. And two of them have a couple of kids apiece. So there's one batch. Well, I've got a sister who has um, five kids. And one of them has three kids, uh, her grandkids. And um, I thought, and she was avid to come with her family. And not only that, I've got um, uh, first cousins in San Francisco that she had met that I've never met. And she said, boy, you really ought to uh, invite Aaron and his wife and two kids. And, uh, well, okay. So um, I, I've been in kind of, kind of a, um, a dither, let's say, getting ready for them. But we had a great time, and only 18 of them showed up. And, uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, 
and they all the the last of them went back in the train yesterday. So I've spent most of the day cleaning up a little bit, and I'm afraid napping most of the day. <laughs> so I I really haven't had not only is not the time, but not the energy to uh, give this the attention I should. Have. So so with that, it looks so like let's uh, put it off until next time. Yeah, but we'll be continuing this no, public hearing and keeping the record yeah. open. So. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you continue it to yeah. a date and place certain, and then you'll not have to give notice again. Okay. Yeah. So would um, the next work session, Marilyn, is there, is there time for that to fit? Yeah. For our next work session, yes. which is the... September 11th. September 11th. Okay. At 4 p.m.? Jim? Um, Can I ask yeah. a question of, of Jim? Yeah. Uh -huh. Can we continue a public hearing to a work session? Or does yes. it need to come back to us? Is it still there. a meeting? Okay. This nomenclature of hearing and work session is all for the benefit of the council. They're all council meetings. Okay. And you can have a public hearing in that council meeting as well as this council meeting. That right. is not a very good time for a lot of people to attend a public hearing, I'll have to say. Um, well, it, and actually, I think most, most of the time is going to be probably spent with the council asking questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can still submit testimony but there is a lot that was submitted tonight yeah, the um, advantage to keeping it open yeah. as a public hearing is if you want to hear a response from someone to new text language mm -hmm. then you need to have a hearing if you close the hearing you really can't receive those responses mm -hmm. well I'd like to keep the hearing open yeah okay all in right fact, I was talking to Mr. Bowler I, I, I yeah. need yeah. Okay. so the hearings left is kept open and we will plan that for September 11th then. thank you okay all right, thank you. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, Mike. No, you're good. <laughs> okay, um, now, Council, let's see, we are on page um, 163 here, and this is another public hearing. So this one is a sale of 370 square feet of city-owned real property located at the southwest corner and part of Hazelwood Park. And I see um, Mr. Ed Hodney coming forward, Parks Director. So I'll open the public hearing at 8.57 p.m. Okay, Ed. All right, thank you, ma'am. This won't be nearly as long a public hearing as what you just went through. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it, you've got two maps in your packet uh, that I think adequately describe what it is that uh, we need to be doing. State law requires that we hold a public hearing and, and it has been duly advertised in the Albany Democrat Herald. And so here we are. I have not received any written comment or uh, testimony uh, related to this item at this point, um, but you certainly may receive some additional comment today. Uh, other than just the general formalities of uh, the process we have to go through, if you have any questions for me, I'd be glad to answer those. Okay, questions? Yeah, Bill? I was just curious what BPA needs a little sliver of property for. They, um, some time ago, Bill, realigned their transmission lines and to maintain whatever clearances they require um, horizontally and vertically, uh, they needed to move a fence. And so the fence just happened to encroach, the new location of the fence encroached into the park. Okay. That's why the corner clip. Very good. Okay. Any other questions? All right. This was also a year and a half long process, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I can imagine. All right. Is there anyone that would like to comment on this, um, for this public hearing on the, um, the real property transfer for, at Hazelwood Park? Not seeing anybody. With that, I will close the public hearing at 8.59 p.m. Council, you have a resolution on page 166. Move to approve. Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. All right, thank you, Ed. And we will see you out at the Art and Air Festival all weekend. Yes, thanks. Um, next is business from the public. Anyone here that would like to bring an item forward? Okay. All right, not seeing anyone. Um, next would be adoption of a resolution. This one is on page 168. This is approving an extended property tax abatement agreement for Thai Squared Technologies and the South San Enterprise Home. 
So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. That one was fast. Um, next, we have the adoption of a consent calendar, and that is just two items on there. If there isn't anything that needs to be pulled off, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Next is airport um, improvements, and this starts on page 178. And we have Mr. Goldman coming forward. John. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Hopefully this will be really quick. It's uh, the, the memo and the two resolutions before you tonight are basically step two of two of this FAA grant acquisition. Uh, step one was back at the June 28th Council meeting when Council authorized staff to apply for this FAA grant funding to complete an apron rehab project out at our airport. Total project cost, including construction, engineering, and contingencies, is a little over $1.4 million. Um, an FAA grant totaling just shy of 1.3, which equals 90% of the project cost, is, is now available. And um, it, the requirement from the FAA is a 10% local match, which for us is $143,500. Uh, staff recommends that council authorize by resolution the acceptance of these grant dollars. Staff also recommends council authorize by resolution the transfer of that 143-500, which is our 10% match. Basically transferring that from our airport capital project over to the FAA capital projects program. It's just a budgetary move. And one final thing, staffers request that council award the bid um, to construct this project to the loan bidder, which was Kodiak Pacific Construction. There were five total bids. They were the low bidder, and they came at in under uh, 1.266 million. The high bid out of those five was 1.634 million. The construction is scheduled to begin early next summer, as soon as the uh, weather breaks. That's really it. Any questions? Questions, uh, right? On the, uh, our, your bid tabulation sheet, mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that I th uh, saw that I, I perceived was missing from what we normally see is under the bidder uh, names is where they're from. So were any of them local that even bid on it? Uh, got that sheet. Uh, North Sandy Am, I know, is uh, up in the Salem area. State. State. Pacific, Pacific Excavation is in Eugene, but for years they had an office here in Albany. KD's out of Salem. Kodiak's up around, I want to say, Tiger, Tualatin. Does it say John? Yeah, I. I don't have well, that information. Uh, it was just a, just a point of order, that's all. Yeah. It's, uh, I will say that airport work is kind of unique, uh, and these are the players. Okay. And uh, Kodiak, top-notch outfit, really does good company to work for. Does good work. Mm -hmm. Good. good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions of John? In other words, there is a resolution on page 179. It's the first one for the eight front improvements. Move for adoption of the resolution. Okay. On page 180. Is there a second? Oh, second. Okay. Any discussion? Bessie, did you say page 180? 179. I know, but I'm I... sorry. I think... The first one is 179. Okay, thank yeah, you. second one. Yep. Good catch. Sorry. Thank you. I'm going to hit him as Any other... Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. And next would be resolution on page 180. And this one is for the um, um, capital, um, the transfer. Federal Aviation Administration Capital Grant Program, accepting the transfer. Move for the adoption of resolution on page 180. Second. Okay, motion's been made in a second. Any discussion on this motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 
oppose, same sign. Okay, motion carried. And last would be awarding a contract in the amount of um, one. Million two hundred sixty-six thousand two hundred sixty-six dollars to the low bidder Kodiak Pacific Construction. Move to approve. Second. All right. Any more discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion carried. Okay, you've got it, John. Yep. Thank you. And um, council next, we have appointments. There's two of them coming up, and those were the ones that were just we had, just took action on the resignation. So the first one would be appointing Garwin Burroughs to the Airport Advisory Commission. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Same sign. Okay. Motion carried. Next is appointing Diane Hunsaker to the Planning Commission. Move to approve. Second. Third. Safe. Okay. Safe. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. We are really cruising through things now. Next would be um, under reports. Let's see, this starts on page 187, and this is designating a voting delegate and alternate for the 2017 League of Oregon Cities Conference. And it looks like who's going is just um, Bessie and myself I'll be there. and Peter's coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so council, you'll need to um, appoint um, a voting delegate and an alternate. Approve as written. Yeah, but which one? Which one? Sharon, Bessie, or Peter? Oh, and an alternate. Yeah. I would like Sharon to be the delegate. Um, I'm, I'm going to be there, but I'm just not sure of the time. So. Oh, on the time. So I then the I'll alternate. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll be okay. Okay, Second that's that. fine. Okay, is there a motion? That was the motion. <laughs> okay. And I'll second it. All right. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Um, next is library. And I see we have our library director here this evening. Hello, Ed. Did he bring a book? Oh, good. <laughs> oh, well, it's his book. Good evening, um, Madam Mayor and Council. Thank you um, for taking time. Thank you for your good work. Uh, very short memo. Basically, you may recall that our full-time librarian, head of youth services, uh, Doris Hicks, retired in the spring. And she spent the last dozen or so years, she is fluent in Spanish, um, the past dozen or so years built a really successful niche um, of outreach and programming to uh, Spanish-speaking families and um, folks who, you know, want their kids to become bilingual. So they're all kinds of good things happening. And basically, um, we're asking, as per your policy, for a, a small bump up um, in FTE. Currently, the library's at 21.2. This would bump us up to 21.7. And incidentally, it's still lower than when we opened the new building nine years ago. So um, certainly able to accommodate it um, in, the, in the current budget the increase and, and also moving forward um, we we have retirements coming and other plans for reorganization so um, and looking forward to continuing Doris's good work and we do have a staff um, member who's a professional librarian in the lower classification so we want to increase her FTE and um, also reclassify her so that she her uh, professional skills match um, moving forward. And as the memo indicates, we would do this regardless. Um, we think it's time to put a little more attention and focus in, in that um, part of our community, library services. Um, and so really, um, if that doesn't make any sense to you, I, I would love to answer um, questions and... Um. Okay, questions, Okay. Yeah. All right, 
Council, what would you like to do with this? Move to authorize the position change. Second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. You got it. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you, Ed. Okay, Chris, I can see you back in the room. You're ready for your code enforcement team report. <laughs> and I think seen tonight, I don't know if you saw pictures, but we got one we want to add to your list. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it right here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember going to River Rhythms and walking by the front of it thinking, whoa, but I had no idea what the whole perimeter of that property looked like. So <laughs> It's kind of a few weeds <laughs> at that place. <laughs> kind of a fire hazard, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, this is the time for our annual report. A little bit late in the year, but we have a, obviously, uh, Chris has been very busy over the last 12 months. Uh, I believe I've summed up what all we have been doing, what mostly Chris has been doing. Uh, I believe that the uh, Central Albany Revitalization Area is giving their money's worth. And we have done a uh, much more thorough job of tracking reports and following up. Uh, things are getting done more quickly because this works very quickly. Uh, we've had some notable uh, accomplishments this year, long-standing problems that didn't stand as long as others have in the past. No, no. Chris, you want to talk about any that are of particular interest? Well, actually, uh, top one, 1250 Madison, today actually got served with chronic emotions okay. paperwork, uh, which you guys passed um, when I was going through all the code changes and stuff like that. That one has had jumps and crash and complaints since 2004. Uh, it still persists today. This year alone, they've had about 66 call-outs. Um, neighbors are just kind of fed up with it. Mm -hmm. The city provided them with a 40-yard dumpster, of which I think for the ton it was about $400. If a ton was put in there, they only put about $40 in there. The whole 40-yard dumpster cost the city $88. Uh, they kind of refused to do anything even with that help. Um, so we went ahead and moved forward with just the chronic nuisance property, which would allow the city to abate it and go forward if they still don't even want to do anything to vacating that property. Um, mm -hmm. I know the surrounding neighborhood's going to appreciate it as they always come out and we go out there and express their unsatisfaction with what's going on. Angst. Yes. In a very yeah. kind way. <laughs> um, the one actually beneath that, the 595 Gary, um, I just got an email while I was here. They had started the cleanup today. They did put a chain across there. They had a ton of dumping on that site which is right next to Bowman Park, that empty lot. Um, there's trucks going there. There's a white Ford truck. I couldn't get a plate. There's a camera across the street um, that was dumping there for a while. Uh, that's all been cleaned up today. They've added a chain to the property, and they've signed trespass letters for that property so that we can take action. And they're currently mowing and getting it all in order. And then they're going through the building process to hopefully the condos there. Mm -hmm. But I can't speak for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of mowing, we have been very pleased with the change in the ordinance allowing us to abate vegetation complaints um, quickly rather than waiting for fire season, which usually gives us about, a, at the most, a six-week window to get things mowed and well noticed in that mowed. And now we're allowed to do that year-round with anything that's more than 10 inches high, and it's been uh, been good. We haven't had to order a whole lot of abatements. No, I think we're at three. Three. Yeah. We, we, some of them have been expensive. We had one that was over $2,700 this week mm -hmm. for a two and a half acre parcel that is chronically up and neglected, but we'll be, we'll be uh, building them and leaving them if possible, if necessary. We've been getting pretty good compliance with sending people bills and getting them for what the work that we've had done is getting them to pay us back. Oh, yeah, just being good. in constant mm -hmm. contact with the banks and stuff like that who are kind of neglecting that and mm -hmm. keeping up on them. They've been pretty willing to pay. Uh, there's even another one on 1530 Lafayette, which is on the list. 
we have a six hundred and seven dollar, I believe, board of fee of that house. Um, the bank just took custody of it and they're going to be paying that. We sent them the bill today, and they've been in contact with me to square that up so that they can move forward. And they're wanting to put a trespass letter on it and take back the property from the city, um, so that they could refurbish and sell, which is the ultimate goal of that. You know, yeah. bring a better situation. Mm -hmm. I also want to call out 405 Denver Street, the city that the property that the city has title to. With, that was a result of a settlement with the city attorney's office, and in exchange for dismissing junk and trash complaints, uh, that property is now the bank is now interested in selling that property. So hopefully, we won't be property owners much longer, and we will get reimbursed for our the work that we did to clean it up, which was a considerable effort by Parks and Recreation and the Sheriff's work through over about a year. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. The other one on there, uh, 2830 Arlington, which is probably one of the properties I get most calls on, mm -hmm. um, burned down a while ago, I think over about a year and a half ago. Almost three years ago. Oh, three years ago. Uh, they're finishing up their probate this month, and their main goal is to get out for sale. Uh, I had contact with a couple of people who were interested in buying it, and that information has been passed on to their attorney so that when the probate is finished, hopefully that can move quickly. And okay. both buyers' goal was to demo and rebuild and just kind of refurbish the whole area, which everyone, I'm sure, they will be extremely happy with. Mm -hmm. One other one I can add that is not on this report but would be on the next uh, six month report, but is a, a current in discussion here is 330 Maryland Street. I remember Mr. Yeah. Such who came to visit and we've made efforts with the county to get them to clean it up. The sheriff's work crew took care of that for us two weekends ago. It took two days, a 40 yard dumpster, and then Parks and Rec hauled away some of the last <coughs> uh, branches, and it is clean. Mm -hmm. uh, question mm -hmm. did, did the work crew take care of the expense of the work crew, or did we have to? We will be charging the county for that as we would any other property owner. Other but property we're, having to, we're having to pay the sheriff's work crew? Yes. Yes, we're fronting the bill. And that wasn't the understanding the I was going to get. Oh, I'll talk to Mr. I'll talk to John about that. Mm -hmm. the, that was a, to be one, a horrible situation where cool. they kind of refused to work. Um, so they didn't want to act like any other property owner would. So therefore, we took the steps as we would with any property owner to get it done. And they will you say to they square up that bill, the county. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, well that, they don't own it. In my opinion. They they don't own it. Well, any foreclosed property. But it's not back. foreclosed. It's in the process, and that therein yeah. lies the problem. Yes and no. If you go with any bank, banks will manage their property, yeah. but the county refuses. And they want to wait until that other property. Well, the bank owned the, the property prior, prior to, well, yeah, it doesn't make any it, difference. It's a mess, I mean, but it's getting done. And it's, it's because of the state. Yeah. Um, because the, that was one of many places where they, uh, the people who were there uh, took a um, set-aside program for taxes. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then there's a lien put on the property. And yeah, in addition to the lien, like that. well, that's a, in addition to the lien, then there's also interest at a phenomenal rate put on the property. And when it's done, then the people who own the property look at a $70,000 bill and a $40,000 value and walk away. Oh, yeah. That house is, and it has to be demoed. It's worth what the land's worth, yeah. nothing else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have Bill? you had a chance, or staff, to look at that house on Belmont you and I discussed? We have not. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. So have you had much more complaints, though, over tall, dead grass this year since there has been a lot of tall, dead grass? You know, have you I'm seen that? I remember the last count I had. It was almost at 200 mm -hmm. cases. Wow. Uh, I think only of those 200, I decided about 15. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to do anything, and of those 15, we've abated three, okay. or at the city cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So when somebody said they didn't want to do anything, maybe yeah. they just don't want to. I mean, after <laughs> my process has been to forget what the building department has done and mm -hmm. just kind of give everyone a clean slate. The first complaint, you get a notice, you get two weeks. If that doesn't happen, then you get a citation and 30 day abatement notice, certified mail. And once that 30 days is up, if it still hasn't happened, you're talking, you know, six weeks now, then mm -hmm. the city moves to abate. Okay. Which yeah. is more time than. It's more lenient than the code actually allows, but I figure for the first year and for first time offenders, it's fair, especially yeah. with the new coaching. Do you, does the property owner uh, find out who has made the complaint at all? I would say probably 90% are anonymous. They just come out on the phone and they're there, but no, I don't advertise who made the complaint. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is one of our best programs, I tell you, that before we ever had it because it's, it's been very effective ever since it was first established so so thank you so much thank you and Marilyn how long have you been overseeing it since July 1st 1999 okay <laughs> <laughs> yep it was great that, we got <laughs> that was with Steve Bryant then too getting this established yeah uh-huh thank you Chris and Marilyn Okay, um, council next is business from the council. And Rich, anything this evening? Nope. Okay, Ray? Nope. Mike? Uh, this might be for, for Chris. I've hit a couple of people. I live over behind the new police station off of 29th. And there's been a couple of people that have stopped me on my evening walk and have noticed since. smoke craft went out of business they're starting to get a lot of uh, rodents is the best word in that neighborhood and to the to the point that one lady says she can't even plan anything because the rodents are eating it no we're talking another kind of uh, rats. Rats. ratatious rats <laughs> and they're not they're not little um, there, one lady says she doesn't even put her bird feeder out anymore because she can sit and watch the bird, the the rats, climb up the pole and start eating everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason they the said it's it started after Smokecraft went out of business, went 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 away, and they think it's coming from um, ALS, the transfer station there. That's where they think the the animals are coming from and they just want to know if there's something we can do um, but I've had more than one person stop me and ask me to do something about the rats so so uh, I'm asking right yeah there's stuff we can that take months but we have an investigation go to road at Harvard Road okay okay so thanks and we never used to have complaints Marilyn what past five years we started mm -hmm. getting rat complaints and a lot of it was because of bird feeders that if you put a food source out there they're going to multiply and so um, we have seen it but they're almost all over town I I found them in my backyard getting eating my grapes so um, they're just kind of populating all over and we're not the only community we've seen news stations have done but Portland's had problems and a lot of others but it's mostly animal food put outside they just you give them a food source and they're gonna keep on coming food water and a place to hide yeah. if people have a lot of junk or old wood or whatnot in the backyard they'll they'll take up residence there. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so um, okay it's interesting <laughs> anything else Mike? No, Bessie, did you have anything? Nothing. Okay, Bill. No. Dick. No. Right, and I didn't. We just don't. Oh, actually, I do. This was um, brought down here to City Hall for us. That's you know the Lynn County rocks people that paint rocks and they hide them everywhere and probably around Talking Water Gardens. I think they're found there all the time. She painted our Waverly Lake duck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's Lori Upmeyer. And she did it exactly like the duck. So um, so very artistic. So I guess evidently 
we um, need to hide this duck somewhere or put it somewhere. Um, I don't know. I will find. I'll contact her and find out what she would like put it, done. Put it at the end of the anchor. Yeah. So oh that's very <laughs> true. It will anchor it down. So here, yeah. You mentioned talking water gardens. Uh -huh. uh, question possibly for Chris or whatever. Uh, a year or so ago, we had a huge uh, algae infestation. Uh -huh. How is that happen going this year? Is it clearing up or? He ain't into algae. good yeah so okay well I think this was very nice of Lori to paint the, the rock so yeah it's a lot nicer than Ralph's but yeah that's true <laughs> that's why I brought it down here because I thought the yeah. mayor might like her version of Ralph's rock take, take the place <laughs> yeah the action oh. <laughs> yeah, she kind of put down um, yeah, from a created by well, Steve yeah, Fletcher, yeah, 1980s yeah, owner of the yeah, Spray yeah, Foam and Rough like Upon Malewood Duck, yeah. 400 pounds, 400 pound duck. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it is. Gary Carlson really knows that as he was getting that duck, you know, back in the lake. So, okay, um, that's it. Peter, anything? Well, I, would, I would just have to note that uh, there was a lot of preparation that went into the eclipse. And this, this room here was set up Friday night as a ECC. And on Monday morning, several people staffed it. And uh, everything with it went without any uh, mishap. But I, I was comforted and, and uh, reassured to see how, how uh, easily the ECC staff came together, how efficiently the room was turned into an ECC. And I would say that preparation equals performance. And I'm glad that uh, we, we are able to be so prepared, even though Nothing happened this time. So, mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was great. Was great. Um, I do think it was probably very good for encouraging businesses that weren't, you know, providing essential services to mm -hmm. to close up that day. If we would have had regular commuters coming up and down the freeway and um, within our highway system, I think there would have been probably quite a jam up. So because I five was sure jammed up on Monday yeah. all day long. So, yeah, it was still, well, because it was a wreck, but it was still totally standstill till like 7, 8 o'clock southbound of Eugene. So, yeah, but, um, so nope, everything went smoothly, and boy, it was a spectacular event. Okay, that's it. Any staff have anything else? You might notice we have a fourth camera. Yep. I nope. saw that. Yeah, yep. we have no idea how it's coming out, how it's turning oh. out, but... Michael will let us know. So does that cover the whole? Yeah. It covers right in the middle. It covers the city manager, city attorney, and mayor. Okay. And that one covers the U3. Yes. That one covers U3. And what, there's one up. Where's the other one? That goes to the podium. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, with that, we will recess to executive session to discuss pending litigation or litigation likely to be filed in accordance with ORS. 192.6602H. Okay?